Praise God. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you might be. We're just thankful that you're able to be able to listen to or watch this presentation. It's entitled, Look What God Has Done. It's what God does, not what we do, but what God can do for us. And I want to greet all the ASI members. We've been a member of ASI since uh, 1995. And we want to greet all of you and all of those, uh, the donors that have been supporting this ministry and getting out the present truth, present truth message for this time. Get on board or drowned is the message that Noah gave. And it, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was given another straight message. Uh, get, out of, get out of the city or you're going to be burned. So uh, we have a message here for the end times, and that is get right or get left, basically is the bottom line. So I want to greet each and every one of you and thank you for taking the time to watch or listen to this program. If you'd bow your heads with me as we seek the Lord in prayer. Father, we just praise you. We thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your kindness, your tender mercies. I pray for your holy angels to surround us, drive away evil forces. I pray for your Holy Spirit to guide my words, my thoughts, my actions. May they be pleasing in thy sight for your glory and uh, for the betterment of your cause and the saving of souls. In Jesus' glorious and wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, our presentation is entitled, Look What God Has Done. And as I thought about this, this was the text that came to me in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Amen. So we're going to give all the praise and glory to God. As I'm sharing what God has done for this little mom and pop ministry, I want you to understand this is for His glory, for His praise. Nothing to do with feathers in our caps because we know we can't do it. We're not capable of it. I'm not talented enough to do what God has done. But He has um, worked mightily in our, in our lives, uh, my wife and I lives to do the, the mission of Project Restore that God has given to us. A little bit of background, I'm a prodigal son. I was out of the church for many years, many years, uh, and I went into the military, and after I got out of the military during uh, the Vietnam crisis, as they called the uh, police action at one time, um, uh, then I uh, was uh, honorably discharged, and I went to work for the state of Maryland in law enforcement, and uh, the Lord just richly, richly blessed in my life, and I'm so thankful for His mercy and compassion. And moms and dads out there, if you've got children uh, that are out in the world of not uh, having any connection with the Lord Jesus Christ right now, keep on praying. Keep on praying. My mother prayed for me for many, many years, and uh, her prayers moved the impotent arm of God to get my attention to bring me back to the Lord where I can praise Him, worship Him, and try to help save as many to the kingdom as we possibly can by the grace of God. So keep on praying, keep on praying. I didn't uh, know exactly what the Lord had for us to do. We did go to ministry. The Lord called us out. Um, I had almost enough years to retire. My wife was a four-year degree uh, nursing in nursing, and uh, God called us to do His work with a little ministry, making almost nothing, uh, asking us to leave our retirements, asking us to leave our brand new home, asking us to leave all the, the insurances and the medical insurances and all the various things and walk away from that. And uh, we did seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things should be added unto you, we're told. Uh, and God has never let us down. So we went to work for a ministry for nine years. We were there, and God taught us a lot of wonderful things. He taught us things about what to do, what not to do. And then after the nine years, He called us to do the ministry uh, Project Restore. Uh, one day, as I was uh, taking a shower, I had the radio on, listening to news, whatever, and I was just contemplating about renewing my concealed carry weapon. 
And, uh, you know, if you have to update them from time to time. And I heard on the radio, put away your sword and pick up your pen. Well, I had no idea what that meant at that point, but it wasn't long I did know. And so when the Lord called us out, um, he just did some, some miraculous things. In volume nine of the Testimonies for the Church, I read this statement. What we need is a living faith, faith to proclaim over the rent sepulcher of Joseph, that we have a living Savior, one who will go before us and who will work with us. God will do the works if we will furnish him the instruments. We couldn't do the works, but we furnished him by the grace of God. We furnished him the instruments in ourselves by doing his will. There needs to be among us a great deal more prayer and much less of unbelief. We need to lift up the standard higher and still higher before the people. We need to remember that Christ is always at our right hand as we proclaim a liberty in to the captives and deal the bread of life to the hungry ones. We have to lift him up and know that he is always at our right hand to work with us. That same right hand that holds up the universe. The universe where they're finding 13 and a half billion light years away. They're finding, they're finding galaxies and things out there. It's unbelievable what God is doing. And as I read that, uh, it came to my mind when, when the Lord brought me by His grace, back to Him and seeing His goodness and mercies. He reminds me of this text in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 9 and 10, the last part of verse 9 and verse 10. Thou art my servant. I have chosen thee and not cast thee away. When I was a renegade and when I was in rebellion, when I was a prodigal son, He did not cast me away. He continued to work with me. He continued to woo me. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen you. Yea, I will help you. Yea, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Praise God. Again, that same right hand uh, that holds the universe in place and everything works in accordance with His plan, in accordance with His will. It's just amazing, the wondrous God that we serve, and we want to give Him all the praise and all the glory. So we left, uh, we left our retirements, we left our home, we left our security as far as the world's concerned. We went to work with a little ministry, an educational ministry. Uh, we worked there for nine years, and uh, when I was there, I learned a lot of things to do, but I also learned a lot of things not to do. And so the Lord uh, called us, and uh, he wanted us to start a ministry called Project Restore, and it's based on Malachi. Malachi, if you have your Bibles, open to Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. I'll stop right there. We are to be the Elijahs of our day. Elijah's message was, how long he held between two opinions. He you, Either serve God or serve Satan, but you can no longer sit on the fence because the fence belongs to Satan. We have to get a message out there to cause people by the Holy Spirit to make those decisions here at the time. Great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. That is the message that we are to give to the world the Elijah message for our day. Again, how long he halt between two opinions. Uh, we've got to make a decision. You've got to make a choice, and this is what we are to do in our ministry. As we looked at this Project Restore and what we're to be doing, I came across a few, few texts that got us into the literature work, the printed page. I want to read to you in page uh, 140, 140 of Testimonies to the Church. It's for the Church. Testimonies for the Church, not against the Church, for the Church. If you haven't read them, dust them off. Read them. Read them together, husband and wives. Pat and I did that, and I used to get beat up about every night, but I didn't complain because I know God was trying to help me to develop the character needed so that we can make it through to the kingdom and love each other even more. 
It says on page 140, volume 7 of the testimonies, and in a large degree, through the publishing work or houses, is to be accomplished the work of that other angel who comes down from heaven with great power, who lightens the earth with his glory. It's talking about the fourth angel of Revelation chapter 8, 18, verse 4. Come out of her, my people. Be not partakers of her sin. Receive not of her plagues. This is a message that we must give, and this is what Project Restore is, was founded upon, getting these messages out, uh, these very things to the world, and also to try to do what we can to wake up a sleeping church. Because remember, it says all the virgin, wise and foolish, were slumbering and sleeping, and it's time to awaken out of that slumber and that sleep, that's for sure. In the great controversy, we find this uh, other statement is very important, page 612, when it comes to the printed page. Page 612 of the great controversy, it says, the publications distributed by missionary workers have exerted their influence, yet many whose minds were impressed have been prevented from fully comprehending the truth or from yielding obedience. But now the rays of light penetrate everywhere. The truth is seen in its, in its clearness, and the honest children of God sever their bands, which have held them. Family connections, church relations are powerless to stay them now. Truth is more precious than all besides. Notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take their stand upon the Lord's side here at the end. Praise God. This is what the literature work is going to do. You know, praise God for television ministry, radio ministry, uh, internet ministry, you know, YouTube, all these things. But the final work that's going to be done in the work, it's going to be right down to the end, will be the medical missionary work and also the printed page. And we are so, so thankful that we are involved in that. A lot of people, especially young people, ask me, you know, I feel the Lord wants me to have a ministry and I want to get a ministry going and this is what my ministry is about and this is what I want to do. And I always tell them this, remember one thing, God never calls you to a ministry or for, to do something for Him unless He have people waiting in the wings to help make it happen. None of us are an island. You know, God sends other people to help in many ways. When we first started, we, we made the decision by God's grace to start Project Restore. I was in Bakersfield, California. I was with a friend of mine there and uh, I had a speaking engagement out that way, but we decided we'd go over to prayer meeting over at the Oildale Church uh, just outside of Bakersfield, California. When I got there, uh, Dr. Uh, Marion Bernard was there and he was leading out or whatever and he saw me and he said, Ron, glad you're here. Would you be able to lead out in the uh, prayer meeting tonight? And I said, well, let me go out and get my briefcase out of the, out of the vehicle and, and see what the Lord has in store for us tonight. See what he had me talk about. Anyway, after prayer meeting was over, we, we had prayer and I asked him to please pray for uh, uh, this venture that my wife and I were going to step out in faith and do, and that would be the ministry of Project Restore. And after we had our prayers, prayer meeting was over and people were discussing, a young couple came up to me and said, you know, for the last three weeks, Ron, we have been praying and asking the Lord to show us what ministry we should be supporting. And he revealed that to us tonight. Project Restore is that ministry. And friends, I must tell you from that point on, God has been so faithful, which He always is, but so faithful with uh, this ministry, um, this mom and pop ministry, um, who has been able to not only print, but help uh, distribute through many different ways. And I'll share with that a little bit more here later. But to be able to print and share over 100 million, not little pamphlets, but magazines and books. Don't misunderstand me, little pamphlets are important too, as well. But over 100 million, over 100 million uh, books and magazines, 32 page four color magazines. Um, 
But we joined ASI again in 1995. We joined ASI. We learned in ASI to network with other ministries. And I want to share with you, ASI members, you need to share uh, and be in touch with other ministries and help each other to network because you can save a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of energy if we learn to network so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And we learned to network back in the early 90s uh, or right after we joined ASI. We networked with uh, Henry Cowan, Jeannie Cowan at Family Heritage uh, Books out of Georgia. We learned to network with them. And first thing we networked with them is that there was going to be a major Promise Keepers rally up in Washington, D.C., and uh, there was over a, a million people there. A million men were there on the mall. It was packed. It was, some of you might have been there. But uh, we organized by the grace of God. God helped us to organize. We had 137 uh, fathers and sons that were out there to help us hand out uh, the America Superpower Prophecy Magazine to the Promise Keepers. They were coming from all over this country and other parts of the world. And we were able to get out in six hours, we were able to get out 140,000 magazines. 140,000. As a matter of fact, some of the promise keepers, we'd hand them a stack and say, make sure all your people in your group gets one. And they were helping us hand it out. I mean, it was a miraculous. And uh, finally, just at the end, it was all over. Uh, a police sergeant came up and said something about we weren't supposed to be handing out. This is their event, they, and they scheduled this. And he said, well, that's fine. But here, let me give you one so you know what we're handing out. But we were about through and done at that point anyway. But we got out of 140,000. It's just amazing. I've gone to churches in different parts of the United States. I've been there and I share this story um, about all these promise keepers there. And we were getting out. And, and uh, some of you in this church, I would say, I think was out helping us. And, and somebody would raise their hand and say, well, I wasn't there helping handing out the literature. I was there receiving the literature. And now my wife and I, our family are Seventh-day Adventist Christians as a result. Praise God. We get those stories from people a lot, a lot. So we know the printed page works. And uh, one of the things that I did, I tried to prove a point, and it did prove a point, is that I asked people from uh, the Adventist University, which used to be Columbia Union College at that time, and Shenandoah Valley Academy students. I asked people from uh, non-Seventh-day uh, Adventist organization, but private uh, Adventist uh, schools and various things. Some that even said that uh, the church was Babylon. Of course, we never agreed with anything like that, but to try to debate them over it, you might as well save your, t save your breath. Just show the actions of what God's people are doing and supposed to be doing. So I was trying to prove a point that you could have people from all different, different areas of thought, whether it be the conference schools, the, the self-supporting schools, et cetera, brought them all together. And again, we had 137 dads and, and some of their sons there helping us hand out that day. And you know what I noticed, friends? There was not one argument. There was not one debate about the church, what it is, what it is, whether you should go to a conference school, non-conference school. There was no bait, no debates. No arguments, because everyone was focused of getting that present truth to those precious souls out there. And uh, that's what they focused on. And I, I was so glad. And, and, you know, and if our churches would get busy with outreach and soul saving, we wouldn't have as much fighting and negativity in our churches as we have in many of our churches today. Because Jesus is coming, folks. We can sing the songs when we all get to heaven till the cows come home. But if we can't get along with each other, we can't love each other as Jesus would love us to do and how he loves us, we're not going to make it. We're not going to make it through. Well, the Lord has helped us in many ways, not only to get the literature out by the millions in this nation, but also we've done a lot of work in, uh, years ago in India. We work with another ministry that was part of ASI. Uh, with magazines and books, we, uh, they had them, uh, of course I couldn't do it, but uh, the folks over in India, they did. They 
uh, took our magazines, several of magazines, and they put them in different languages like Hindi and all these different uh, languages because they have like 16 languages and I don't know how many dialects or something, it's quite a, quite a number. Um, but we were able to do that and get the books and get some printed in India, some of the great controversy. We did this also, we worked with another man who was working in, in, uh, in China, he was Oriental and he was working in China. We worked with him to have the great controversies uh, printed in Mandarin and uh, in China, surprisingly, and they were scattered in China at the time. Also in Mexico, uh, we have printed millions of Spanish magazines, and uh, we've had other, other ministries, other people wanting to get involved, have a burden for the Spanish-speaking people in Mexico and other areas, and they would take loads, we would uh, loads up tractor trailer, 53-foot tractor trailer loads, and going across the border and getting into Mexico. We also work with another ministry, is an ASI ministry, uh, who has a school in Mexico, and uh, years ago we set up a little printing operation down there. We bought a press, uh, got some people that knew about printing to go down for a while and teach others how to use the printing press, and they would print uh, little uh, uh, books and little things so that they could take them out, and they had a school there, so all the students would go out to the towns and the villages, and they would, they would hand out uh, present truth literature as a result of that, working with Mexico. Right now, we have a friend of mine uh, that's out on the West Coast, but spends most of his time now in Mexico, and right now he is getting tractor trailer after tractor trailer after tractor trailer loaded of Spanish great controversy books that are going in to Mexico, and they are going out like the leaves of autumn, like we're told we're supposed to do, told we're supposed to do. We had some friends that they were part of ASI Australia and uh, known them for years. I used to go over there and speak at many of the cities uh, in Australia, around the coast, and uh, we got to know them quite well. And they started up a big printing operation there in Melbourne. And what we did is we printed lots of materials in, in Melbourne off of those presses and we were able to get the materials into the South Pacific Islands like Fiji, Cook Islands, Papua New Guinea, etc., Vanuatu. Uh, we were able to flood uh, those, those islands with uh, present truth literature. You know, God has been so gracious and so good to us. And uh, we knew the, uh, the uh, division president at the time. Um, he's deceased now. He's waiting for the resurrection, the trumpet to sound. But he, working closely with them, we were able to get, these, uh, to get these books and magazines and things all throughout the islands over there and, of course, in Australia as well. We met at, uh, at ASI some years ago. We met some folks from the Philippines, and uh, we were, and I don't think it was certainly happenstance, it was uh, providential. We uh, were at the same table together having one of the meals at ASI. And I'm gonna tell you what, folks, that's one of my favorite times. Not so much because of the food, that's for sure, but because of the people, and my wife and I always pray, Lord, where do you want us to sit? Who do you want us to be with? That we can maybe connect with them, we can help their ministry get established more, or they can help our ministry. So the whole, the whole plan, the whole thing, and the whole idea of what we're trying to do is for all ministries to flourish. It's, we don't want to be like the disciples of all, well, I did this, or it's my ministry, and we're doing this, and, and we're, we need to be working together, not necessarily joining all the ministries together in a sense, but because God has called you to do something, He's called us to do something. It might not be the same, but God nevertheless is calling us, and we need to do that. But we were setting a table with some of the Philippine Filipino leaders from the central part of the Philippines, and a name came up, a, a fellow that actually bought, uh, the Lord used to bring me back to him, and that, his name was John Earnhardt, used to be with Amazing Facts. Uh, I don't know if he's retired now, but he was in the Carolina Conference. Um, and uh, he said, well, John Earnhardt, get meetings over here. Would you come over and do meetings over here? Would you do evangelistic meetings? And I said, well, you know, if this is what the Lord wants me to do, I, I don't claim to be much of a preacher. But if this is what the Lord wants me to do, 
uh, then we'll do it. And one thing led to another, and uh, we ended up in the Philippines, and we did, uh, we were over there about six different times doing crusades in various islands in the central part uh, of the Philippines. We even uh, did a crusade in, in prison in the prison, and praise God, 47 prisoners were baptized as a result of those meetings. Uh, they weren't too open at first. I think they were there just to get the free sandwich and a drink or something. Uh, and they just all down in the face, uh, you know, everybody hates me, nobody loves me, I think I'll go eat a bowl of worms type of look on their face. And uh, anyway, the fellow that I was with, Ray, Ray uh, Heathman, um, he did the health lectures, I did the doctrine lectures by the grace of God. And Ray got up and gave his testimony in one of the meetings and talked about how he used to be in drugs and how he was dealing, how he was doing all kinds of things, how he was shot. Um, and uh, he was sent to prison. And then I got up there and gave my testimony about how that I was in law enforcement and I used to deal with people like him and lock people like him up. And from that night forward, everything changed. They realize what God can do to take two opposites, opposite side of issues, and join them together to up preach Jesus to, for the saving of souls. When we go in from that point on, there were smiles on their faces. Things really changed. And I think that's why so many were baptized as a result. Not only did we go over there uh, six times, but uh, several others went over there that we helped organize and help you know, invite them to go over and get them established and connect them with the right people. And uh, so as a result of that, uh, by, again, by the glory of God, thousands of people were baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church from all those different meetings. I remember they invited us to do meetings at one of the main churches there in the Philippines, and the leadership came out to, to be us. We were at the uh, mission, mission compound there, and they came over to see us. And, Elder, where's your team? Where's your team? And what they meant by that was they wanted to know where all the busload of, of the Americans were. And it was just two of us. And they said, where's your team? And I knew what they meant. So um, I said, well, this is Brother Ray Heathman. He'll do the health lectures by the grace of God. My name is Ron Goss, and by the grace of God, I'll do the doctrinal lectures. I took my Bible and I held it up, and I said, this is their equipment. And I said, the Holy Spirit's the captain of the team. Well, their eyes rolled a little bit, um, but uh, by God's grace, they had more baptisms than they'd ever had before. Most of our magazines, like I said, the millions, uh, tens and tens and tens of millions of um, or uh, magazines have been printed. Most of them were printed at the Review and Herald. Some were printed at Project uh, Pacific Press, um, but most of them uh, with Review and Herald because we were on the East Coast and it was much easier because the Review is only a couple hours from us where we live and where the ministry is, so it worked out much, much better to work with um, Review and Herald. But the Lord got our attention and said, you know, um, we really want that book, The Great Controversy, out. And let me read to you. And this is uh, Cole Porter Ministry and page 127. She says this. The great controversy should be very widely circulated. It contains the story of the past, the present, and the future. It is in its outline of the closing scenes of this earth's history. It bears a powerful testimony in behalf of the truth. I am more anxious to see this book, a wide circulation of this book, than any others I have written. For in the great controversy, the last message of warning is, to the world is given more distinctly than in any of my other books. She says, of all the books, Desire Ages, wonderful, Steps of Christ, beautiful, Patriarchs and Prophets, Acts and Apostles, so many more. But she says, of all of them, I want the great controversy out more because it has the final warning to the world. And let me read this from, from uh, 
Testimonies of Ministers, volume, or no, Testimonies, volume 9, page 119. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them the shining uh, is shining the wonderful light from the Word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. The most solemn truths ever entrusted to mortals have been given to us to proclaim to the world. More solemn than the message of Noah, more solemn than that was given to Sodom and Gomorrah, it is the most solemn truths ever entrusted to mortals. And this is why, friends, we've got to get this out like the leaves of autumn. And so we've been doing that. It says, uh, I was moved by the Spirit of the Lord to write that book, speaking of the great controversy. She says, I love it be above more than silver and gold. The results of the circulation of this book, the great controversy, are not to be judged by what now appears. By reading it, some souls will be aroused and will have courage to unite themselves at once with those who keep the commandments of God, but a much larger number who read it will not take their position until this, or they see the very events taking place that are foretold in it. She says, some will come in who's strong. We know a number of people that have come into the truth as a result of the great controversies. I hear it all the time. I get stories. I get testimonies all the time of people that have come in but most of them aren't going to come in until, until uh, the final events take place. God gave me the light pertained in the great controversy. And she also talks about patriarchs and prophets. The light that is needed to arouse the people to prepare for the great day of God, which is just before us. And friends, I do believe with all of my heart Jesus is coming soon. I do believe that probation is not long before closing. Don't know the day or the hour. I'm not trying to set times by any means, but it is getting close, getting close. Anyone with any spiritual discernment whatsoever can acknowledge that and understand that. It is time to arouse out of our sleeps. It is time to do all that we can to get this magazine or these magazines, these books, this three angels' messages out to the world. So we've been getting these out, and it also says in volume 9 of the Testimonies how we're supposed to do it. Volume 9 of the Testimonies, page 123. 123, we're told. Page 123. Yeah, we're supposed to get this message out to a dying world, a dying world. Let every soul who has received the divine illumination seek to impart it. Let the workers go forth from house to house, opening the Bible to the people, circulating the publications, telling others of the light that they have has blessed their own souls. Let the literature be distributed judiciously on the trains, the modes of travel, in the streets, on the great ships that ply the sea, through the mail. We're told also to get it out through the mail, through the mail. And we have, we have by God's grace, been able to do a lot of that. Uh, we, some years ago, we put uh, one million great controversy books in New York City, in Manhattan. Uh, within a, the center of New York City, a three and a half mile radius, uh, we were able to bulk mail them one million books that went out. And of course, we got a lot of naysayers. Oh, most of them will throw them away. They're not going to read them. They're just going to trash. Why don't you save the trees? No. God didn't say get these out like the leaves of autumn. God didn't say send them out everywhere on the streets, go to the houses, through the mail, unless they're going to throw them away. It doesn't say that. It just says do that. And we we're told to do that and God will take care of the ones that are thrown away. I remember years ago, there was a man who drived, uh, he drove a refuge truck, a trash truck, 
and he was taking a load of uh, debris and things to the dump, and he fooling with the levers or something, the things dump, getting ready to dump, and something fell out of the back of the truck and hit next to his foot. It was a great controversy that someone threw away. He took that book home, he and his wife read it, and his entire family became Seventh-day Adventist Christians, and the wife used to support uh, Project Restore with offerings every month to help others to get the great controversy because she knew what it did for them. Uh, she also is now waiting for the trumpet to sound in the morning, but praise God, they got that book before that, their probation closed, and we just are thanking and praising God as a result of it. But also as a result, um, a fellow by the name of Glenn Beck, The Blaze, television and radio, um, one of his staff got a hold of the book, got it in the mail, and she took it to Glenn and said, uh, we, need to, we need to advertise this book. And they did. They advertised it for about a month and a half on The Blaze, on television and radio. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God uh, that uh, they, they did that and was able, able to do that. Uh, years ag just years later after that, I was at a function up in D.C. and I got to meet Glenn Beck. Uh, he was there, uh, Radio Row, they called it. They were getting ready to have a big convention. And I saw him over there. My wife and I started to go over to see him. And the security fellow came out uh, from his group and, and said, uh, what do you need? Uh, I said, I need to see Glenn. He said, what, do you, what you got? I said, well, I got this book I want to present him. And uh, uh, he said, well, he's busy. And he just sort of brushed me off. And he said, well, I'll give it to him. I said, well, I'd like to give it to him myself. Well, he sort of brushed me off. He didn't like that at all. So I said, Lord, what would you have me do? What would you have me do? I need to get his attention so I can get this book in his hands. Well, he, he impressed upon my heart uh, to take one of the books that we sent up into New York, the one he was advertising, and take it and point it towards him and hold it up as high as I could hold it. And it wasn't long. He turned over and looked, saw me over there with that book in my hand, saw the book, and here he came. He came over because he recognized the book. And I said, Glenn, you said on a radio uh, commercial one time, you stopped the lady giving a commercial, and you said of all the books I've ever been sent, You've been sent the Great Controversy more than any other book. You said you must have 500 that's been sent to you. Praise God. I said, did you read it? I said, I'm giving you a hardback copy here right now, my friend, another one. Do you think maybe God's trying to tell you something? You think maybe you need to read this book? And I have heard on some of his radio programs things that he said from time to time would make me think that he did read it. And I did see him uh, again, and he did tell me that he, he read it. So we've had the privilege of meeting, this meeting. But they're going to throw him away, they're saying, up in New York. Oh, they'll just throw him away. So here's what I share with the people. Let's say you have an apartment building up in New York. You tell the super up there that if anybody throws these books away, there's some ladies that went to a Baptist church up in Brooklyn, told the super, if anybody don't want them, throw them away, save them for us. And he did. And then on Sunday, they took all the books and went over and handed them out to the families in the Baptist church there in Manhattan. Praise God. Uh, well, it might have been Brooklyn. But anyway, let's say that only one, one, one person out of 100 apartments kept a book and looked at it and read it and made a little difference in their lives. Just one. One percent. Friends, when you're dealing with a million books, 1% is 10,000 precious souls for the kingdom. 10,000 precious souls for the kingdom. Not only the, them, but also those that they share with later on. And we also found out from the Bible workers that were working up there when Elder Ted Wilson was getting ready to do an evangelistic meeting and they had some meetings in New York City. They said all the ones that they weren't able to contact, most all the people that were open to Bible studies had already gotten the great controversy and were reading it by the time they knocked on their door. Praise God. And some of them were baptized in Ted Wilson's meetings. Matter of fact, one of them said she'd had a dream. She had a dream and she saw angels flying past her window. She didn't understand what that was about. And then the Bible worker came and started sharing these things with her and she knew exactly what God was trying to tell her. We also sent the book out through the city of Philadelphia just before the Pope came to Philadelphia here a few years back. And uh, one of the police officers up there, named name's Eric, 
Uh, he got in touch with us. We got the chance to talk with him and been on the phone with him several times. He was a detective with the Philadelphia Police Department, and one of his jobs was uh, for security for the Pope while he was there uh, in Philadelphia. Now, Eric had been through Catholic schools ever since he was knee-eye to a grasshopper, as they say in the country, and he went through Catholic schools, even through college. And uh, he was now a police detective for Philadelphia, city of Philadelphia. He said, Ron, I got the book. He said, I don't know. He said, if this is from JWs, I'm just going to throw it away. I don't want that. Lord, what should I do? Should I, should I read this book? You know, um, uh, not sure. He said, well, he said, I decided I'd read one chapter. And if it didn't make any sense, whatever, I wasn't going to read anymore. I'd just throw it away. Well, he just took the book and he opened it at random. I don't think it was random. I think he had some help from angels on high. But he opened the book to, um, Can Our Dead Speak to Us? Can Our Dead Speak to Us? Now, here's a Roman Catholic, been raised all his life. And oh, Can Our Dead Speak to Us? He said, I read that chapter. He said, I now understood what death's sleep was all about in the Bible. And I realized that death is asleep until the resurrection. Later on in the conversation, he told me he realized that um, the mother of Jesus, Mary, was asleep and waiting for the resurrection herself. She was not up there interceding uh, for him with Jesus. So these things uh, happen and are real. We, we also sent the book out uh, into Ontario, Canada when the Pope was up there. Uh, we sent it out to San Antonio, Texas, just before the General Conference in San Antonio, Texas. And Pat and I went there a little earlier to, to visit there and talk with the people on the street. Did you show them the book? Did you get this book? Yes, I did. Have you read it? I'm not reading it yet, but it's on, my, it's on my nightstand or it's on the coffee table in the, in the living room. But you know what we found out was so wonderful is that a lot of young people, teenagers that we met working at the you know, little restaurants or whatever, we'd meet them on the street and we'd talk with them. Did you get this book? And they were reading the book. And I'm talking about teenagers reading the great controversy. See, Holy Spirit can, can bring upon the hearts many things, certainly, that we can't do. There was one lady, Catholic lady, working at the convention center there for, for the uh, general conference. And we talked to her. And I asked her if she got the book and said she had gotten the book. And then she started to tear up a little bit. And she was a little upset, not because of the book, but because her church, her priest, had been telling her things wrong all these years, and she now had discovered the seventh-day Sabbath. The seventh-day Sabbath. Yeah, I remember back to the Philippines real quick. I remember when I was doing a meeting in the island of Bantayan, and uh, that night I was doing the, the subject, The Mark of the Beast, and one of the attendees brought their, their uh, relative with her and sitting right up close to the front. And as I'm speaking and I'm talking, I can see this lady's face getting redder and redder. And I'm thinking, oh boy, this is going to be fireworks at the end of this for sure, if not before. Anyway, after the meeting, this lady wanted to see me and she told she was so upset with the Roman church. She says, all these years they've been lying to me. And she was thrilled that she finally found the truth and uh, so that she was studying. And by the way, we work with some others and we did some medical, medical missionary work over there and, and the Lord healed this man that hadn't been able to work for years, had nine children. As a result of that, the Catholics on that island said, we need to know the God uh, that you serve because, and he was Catholic, his wife uh, came to the meetings and because of his healing, there is a new Seventh-day Adventist church there on that island that wasn't there before. Praise God. It still works today. God still works miracles today. But other places that we, uh, we ship to, the cities we've shipped to, is Chicago, uh, Illinois, San Francisco, California, uh, ABC, uh, CBS News, NBC News did stories on the great controversy in those, those cities. And... Uh, and we're told uh, uh, Loughborough, uh, Jan Loughborough wrote a book, The Second Great Advent Movement, and in that book, I think it was page 452, 
where he said uh, when, the, when God's people were being persecuted in the 1800s over the Sabbath issue, the newspapers got a hold of the story, put a story out about it, and Loughborough's comments was the, the media, the newspapers have done more for the spreading of the third angel's message in two weeks than we've been able to do in over 20 years. And I believe that once it hits the news, one day it's going to hit the news, it's going to make a big splash, and it's going to ripple around this world. And friends, we're going to go home. Jesus is going to come. So they did one, good stories, actually. Some said, well, I'll never read it. Others said, well, if they take the time to spend this money and send this to me, I think I owe it to, to read it to find out what, what this is all about. We've sent them into Boston, Massachusetts, De Detroit, Michigan. Uh, Greenville and Columbia, South Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina, Washington, D.C. Matter of fact, we were up there for some meetings and uh, after we had sent the book up there and I saw this one fellow that worked in the uh, Omni Sheraton who shined shoes and I asked him, did you get the book? He said, uh, I didn't get the book in the mail. I was outside of that area that got the, the books, but I found one at a bus stop when I was waiting for the bus and I've got my book and he was reading the book. We did Denver, Colorado, Charlotte, Charlottesville, North Carolina, we did bulk mailings there, and boy, did that create up a stir in Charlottesville, Virginia. They're pretty liberal there. Uh, Louisville, Kentucky, Indianapolis, Indiana, we did that just before the uh, general conference. Well, they, they canceled it out, but then it had already been sent out to the whole city of Indianapolis. We even sent it to Hollywood, California. We got a letter back from the Screen Writers Guild uh, requesting more information and more literature. So. It works. Salt Lake City, Utah, Nashville, Tennessee, New Orleans, Louisiana. We're getting ready to do Portland, Oregon. And some might say, well, we sent it to Portland. Boy, that place is so liberal and all that. Listen, if God can convert the city of Nineveh, he can convert people, residential people living in Portland, Oregon. What do you say? Holy Spirit's working on hearts and towns and cities all over the world. And uh, we need to reach out to them. Uh, St. Louis, uh, Missouri, we also, we had what they call the SWAT team, Swift Witness Action Team. I'm an ex-lawman, so we had Swift Witness Action Teams. When the Pope was there, uh, we had some beautiful contacts, a pastor. I went to visit with him there in the office there in St. Louis. He was so thrilled with the magazines on the Sabbath and uh, America's Superpower Prophecy. And he says, uh, when I came to his office, he was highlighting things in one of the magazines. He says, I'm getting this ready to send to my son. He needs to understand this as well. I sent him the conflict series. We communicated back and forth. Uh, we haven't talked for some time. Don't know what happened, but at least he was enlightened. And hopefully he will and his help his congregation to be ready. We also did zip codes around most of all the Christian universities and colleges. We realized in an 1830s uh, students gave the midnight cry, and why wouldn't students be involved to give the loud cry here at the end? So we sent them around those schools, uh, even Notre Dame. Uh, we sent them there as well. Um, will students play a role with a loud cry? I hope so. We, like I said, over 600,000 books went to the areas around those schools, universities. And uh, We've also, by the grace of God, we've put books in every home in the state of Alaska, West Virginia, and Vermont, and, uh, and that was to every residential address. So that means that everybody got them, whether you're a politician, whether you're a judge, a police officer, whether you're a criminal, a drug addict, wherever you lived, residential, and you think it doesn't affect drug, drug people, there's a young man that went to his drug dealer's place to purchase some drugs. He saw a great controversy setting on a table, and he said, uh, ask him about the book. Now, who did that? The Holy Spirit did that. And uh, he said, are you reading? He said, no, I'm not reading it. Uh, he wanted to know if he could borrow it. He said, sure, go ahead. I'm not planning on reading it. And uh, that young man became a Seventh-day Adventist as a result of that. On the other side of the coin, uh, there was a uh, a uh, metropolitan uh, D.C. police officer went into the captain's office up in D.C. On his desk was laying the great controversy. 
And uh, this officer asked the captain about it, and he said he wasn't really planned on reading it later, but he hadn't, couldn't get to it. Well, can I borrow it in the meantime? Yeah, go ahead and borrow it. Well, that police officer is a Seventh-day Adventist Christian today. It works. It works. I'm telling you, we know it works. So we have these SWAT teams also that we sent out all over. When the Pope was, again, when the Pope was in St. Louis, um, we had three people, non-Adventists, helping us hand out literature. One fellow just got out of prison, happened to be walking by, said, hey, you want a, something to do to help? Uh, we'll make sure you get some groceries while you're helping us and all. And he did. And two out of the three were baptized as Seventh-day Adventist Christians after being there to help out, to get out the literature when the Pope was in St. Louis. Uh, we just praise God for that. Again, I told you, Pope, we were there handing out literature in Toronto, Canada, when the Pope was in Philadelphia. The Promise Keepers in Washington, D.C., one million. Uh, we got them out in um, uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Got a letter uh, from a lady requesting materials, Bible readings for the home out of Phoenix. We sent it to her. Uh, she communicated back and forth. She told us a story. She was a Baptist. Her son, 19 years old, OD'd on drugs and died. And she was upset. Son's lost, and now he's going to be in burning in eternal torment forever, for eternity. And she starts battling back and forth with the God of heaven in her mind. She's battling and battling and battling. My son, he, he made a stupid mistake, but he's going to burn forever in torment. Her baby boy, basically, and you know, Mamas, you know, that if, even if your children's uh, 50 years old, they're still your babies. They didn't really get too old for that. They're still yours. They came from you by God's grace. Anyway, um, she's battling back and forth. She writes us and everything, having this story. She, so uh, the Spirit, uh, the Lord speaks to her through the angel and said, um, you were at a Women of Faith rally in Phoenix. And as you came out the door, someone handed you a magazine. Find the magazine, read it. Didn't tell her where it was, so she tore the house apart till she could find it. It was in the desk drawer underneath a bunch of other stuff. And it was a magazine called Love Stronger Than Death. And she read that, and she realized that when you die, you die. You don't have feelings. You're not in torment. You're not cold. You're not hot. You're not missing anyone. And these type of things. And she read that. And now she is a Seventh-day Adventist Christian as a result. In Detroit, the SWAT teams were there. One of our SWAT team captains, Michael, was there. He had everything set up. He told me how he got there early, got set up, had everything in order. So when the people were coming in to the promise keepers there in Detroit, Michigan, boy, he was at a perfect spot. Well, wasn't long. Here comes a Detroit uh, police officer, city police officer, comes over to him, sergeant, and said, listen, if you don't Get your junk, get out of here. Within five minutes, um, I'm going to lock you up. Oh, no, I'm at the best spot. So he's like a pup that's just been kicked, and he gathers up everything, and he goes over, and they, they had this big skywalk thing from the big parking lots to going into the Superdome or whatever they called it there, and uh, moved him, and he got set up over there. He said, well, I'll get some as they're coming through, but nothing like I was going to get over there. But little did Michael know that the promise keepers had already made arrangements that all the buses and everything was going to come in a certain area, and everybody had to go across that skywalk to get over in the Superdome. He was thrilled. Thank you, Sergeant, for moving me. God wanted me somewhere else, and I thought I was at the best. Another time he was in another city and uh, they didn't have enough people to cover all the exit doors coming out of the auditoriums and things that, to get out the literature. And they, so we got together and we prayed, Lord, please send us some people. And he said, it wasn't long. Here come some fellows over. They didn't look too good. They didn't smell too good. Uh, they didn't act, you know, they weren't really the cleanest people in the world. They said, uh, can we help you? And he said, well, I was reluctant, but we just prayed. We had just prayed, send us some help. So we set them at the, got them to the different areas we wanted them to be and set them up with the literature and the magazines and everything. And he said, I watched them for a while. He said, Ron, they looked like they were old pros at it. They did just fine and said so they had enough. So, you know, sometimes God will send things that we don't think it's too cool. 
but uh, God's ways with his thousand ways, which we know not. Amen. Um, so all over the country, we're doing a lot of smaller uh, bulk mailings to zip codes all over the country. We just send one in to one of the largest zip codes there in San Bernardino, California. That should hit uh, this month, by the end of this month. Uh, so anywhere from California to New York, from Florida to Michigan. T.D. Jakes meetings, Franklin Graham meetings, Women of Faith, Philip Yancey, Benny Hinn, National Day of Prayer, all these different things, uh, Family Research Council, um, CPAC, uh, Conservative Action, uh, Political Action Committee, uh, Capitol, Capitol Buildings, we're there. We've been there with, with uh, the uh, SWAT team members going out. Magazine book, books we talked about going into India, into China, South Pacific Islands, uh, the Crusades and, and things we've done in Mexico. We've had two million books, tractor trailered or train car, going into all parts of uh, Canada where uh, people are going out door to door, from town to town, city to city, handing out great controversies, handing out great controversies. We've had the privilege of conducting meetings in many parts of the world by the grace of God. We have met people here in the United States. In the United States, I've met people here in the United States, and I go to witness to them, I go to share to them, and they say, oh, no, I've got that. Where'd you get it? Well, I was in Sydney, Australia, and someone stopped me and started talking to me and shared with me, and I know they weren't lying because they had some of the material still with them. You just don't know. This is why we've got to be out there and every hand that will take them. Pray. Ask the Lord. Lead me to those that are hungering and searching for truth. And guess what he'll do? You have not because you ask not. But if you ask, you shall receive. You shall receive. Um, we also go into Washington usually twice a year. We go into Washington. We either go up to the Capitol building or we go to some of these major meetings that are going on up there. And our goal is to get the literature into the leading people of our nation, of our nation. Uh, we're told in the Great Controversy, this is why we do it, the Great Controversy, page 610, Great Controversy, page 610, we're told this. Many of our rulers are active agents of Satan, but God also has his agents among the leading men of the nation. So God's got his people. We're also told that a number of these, when the Sunday law comes and various things come, many of these people, relative term, but many of these people will join with God's remnant here at the end. They need to be warned. They need to understand. Uh, upper look, page 86, men in high positions of trust in the world will be charmed by a plain, straightforward, scriptural statement of truth. Many in high positions are heart sore and sick of vanity. They are longing for peace, which they have not. Many would receive it if it was offered to them. And we meet them up there all the time. And, uh, you know, we're told that uh, all the all the things that we need, the assets and everything we need is, is uh, stored there in, in heaven and they are at our command and I am asking the Lord and it's not too much because we need to ask the Lord, uh, command the Lord, it says in the statement that, um, and I feel kind of funny about that, but I'm asking the Lord for a hundred million dollars. There are Adventists who have that, who give that kind of, could give that kind of money and have never miss a meal, never miss a meal. But there are people out there all over that are billionaires and 100 million is a drop in the bucket compared to when you're dealing with billions, when you're dealing with billions. But let me give you and go through some of the names of the people that we've had the privilege of giving great controversies and other materials to. Uh, former Senator Rick Santorum, Pennsylvania, John Bolton, used to be in the Trump, uh, Trump administration, Ron DeSantis, who's the governor of Florida, Nikki Haley running for president, Mike Pence, former vice president, um, Huckabee, Mike Huckabee, Mitt Romney, 
Sean Spicer that was the uh, press secretary for Donald Trump, Eric Trump, uh, Tony Perkins, Ralph Reed, Joyce Myers, Jerry Falwell, Pat Robinson, Bishop E. E. W. Jackson, Matt Staver, who is a former Seventh-day Adventist in charge of Liberty Council. And I asked Matt when I met him, I said, read the book again, Matt. Are you going to, when the Sunday laws come, are you going to try to uh, represent us? He said he would. We'll see. Anyway, these are some. Kellyanne Conway, who was in the Trump. Uh, Mark Meadows, a congressman out of North Carolina, was chief of staff. Uh, Priest Frank Provone, who I've given him the great controversy on two different occasions. Uh, he's basically been... Uh, uh, thrown out of the Catholic Church in many ways. He's been kind of defrocked. He could, last time I saw him, he didn't have his collar on, and he told me what was going on. But uh, uh, Jerry Boykin, who used to be in charge of Delta Force, uh, a general, uh, Lieutenant uh, uh, Colonel Tony Schaefer, uh, Tom DeLay, that used to be uh, a Speaker of the House, George W. Bush, former president, he, he sent me a beautiful letter thanking us for the book. Uh, Trent Lott used to be the top man in, in Congress. Mitch McConnell, who is now the majority leader in the United States Senate. Sam Brownback it was a senator out of Kansas. Uh, I was at a meeting and I went to give him one. I started walking over to him and a Secret Service stopped me and said, don't you take another step forward, sir. Stay right where you are. Lord, how am I going to get this book into his hands? And uh, senator started moving away. Uh, the Secret Service started uh, moving away, and uh, next thing I know, how God did it, it's up to him, praise his holy name. I'm looking eye to ball to eye wall that Senator Sam Brownback was able to give him, give him the material that God wanted me to give him. Newt Gingrich, Brian McCarthy, both of them were speakers of the House. Marsha Blackburn, uh, James Lankford, uh, Don Nichols, who used to be the senator in Oklahoma, I mean, I can go on. Joni Ernest out of Iowa, Jan Brewer, governor of Arizona, Matt Biven, governor of Kentucky, former, Jim Gilmore, former, Matt Whitaker, used to be the former attorney general, Ambassador Francis Rooney. He was an ambassador at the Holy See, folks, at the Holy See. And one of the leaders introduced him to me and my wife. And I think, well, I need to give him the great controversy, but he is, has to be a staunch Roman Catholic to be the ambassador for three years at the Vatican. At the Vatican. You know, Martin Luther said, um, I can't wait to get to Rome. I can't wait to get to Rome. Oh, he just wanted to get to Rome. He gets to Rome, and he sees what's going on, and I think, I think it's a great controversy. Yes, let me read it. Page 125, uh, it says this. No one can imagine, he wrote, what sins and infamous actions are committed in Rome. They must be seen or heard to be believed. Thus, they are in the habit of saying, if there is a hell, Rome's built right over it. And it is a abyss whence issues every kind of sin. I thought if, if Martin Luther could see that, so could this ambassador see that. And you know what? He told me the next day after I gave him the great controversy, he says, uh, Ron, he says, I told my wife about the book and she can't wait to, we get, I get back and we're going to start reading it together. And I'm thinking, oh, okay. Yeah, praise the Lord. Anyway, about a week and a half, two weeks later, we, see, we received a beautiful card letter from this former ambassador to the Holy See thanking us so much for the book. God, most, let me tell you something, folks. Most of those who are going to be saved are not in the Adventist church. Most of those who are going to be saved, based on the Word of God, are coming out of the Babylonian churches. God's faithful in all these different churches are going to come out when we, by the grace of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is going to say, come out of her, my people. Be not partakers of her sins. And as we as we plant the seed of present truth with these books and literature and magazines, many, many, many will come out and join with God's, God's remnant people. Uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, uh, Nigel Farage, out of uh, a politician from England. I've even had the privilege of meeting him. John Ashcroft, that used to be uh, the Attorney General 
of the United States uh, government. He was also the governor of uh, was Missouri and the senator out of Missouri. And uh, the last time I talked with uh, former uh, um, Senator John Ashcroft, these are the last words I heard him say. You Adventists, I believe you Adventists are on to something about this Sabbath stuff, quote unquote. They know, they know. Uh, Porter Goss, who was the head of the CIA, Dan Crenshaw, Jesse Waters, um, maybe Waters World, maybe you know him. I've had a chance to meet and talk with him a few times. Give him literature. Dana Perino, Katie Palabalik, they're all on the, on the five, or Fox News, uh, Michelle Bachman. Uh, I, I mean, I could just go on. Generals, uh, General James Conway, he used to be the commandant of the United States Marine Corps. Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North, you've probably heard of him. E even Alan Robinson uh, of Duck Dynasty, Duck Commander, sent some things to his daddy when he was under fire because he, he said that marriage is one man, one woman, and he was under fire. People were attacking them and all kinds of stuff. So I sent the card. I sent this card to him, and uh, I said, the, great, it, the greatest one of the worlds, the one of men that will not be bought or sold. Men are inmost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men is true to duty as a needle to pole. Men will stand for the, stand for the right, though the heavens fall. I sent him a pack of them to give to his family and to hold, hold the line. When I gave it to Alan, he's the only one without a beard, and he's a, a pastor, a Baptist pastor, I believe. And I gave him the card, and he says, oh, he says, I got this. I said, where'd you get it? He says, well, Daddy gave me one. And then we got a nice letter back from uh, Phil Robinson and his wife thanking us uh, for the materials and things that we had sent to him because I sent the great controversy through his son to give to him. Again, we could go on. We can, many, uh, many of the cabinet uh, secretaries of the United States government, Sarah Palin, Bill Clinton, he's got his kind, Sean Hannity, Chris Plant, Larry O'Connor, these are talk radio show hosts, Mark Levin, Glenn Beck, Mike Gallagher, Dennis Prager, Lars Larson, Sandy Reyes, um, some movie stars, like Dean, I can't remember his name, but he used to, he played Superman in the movies. Gave him one. Uh, Steve Bannon, who has his own programs. Kurt Cameron, uh, that's a Christian fellow that got his great controversy. Again, uh, goes on. Uh, Ted Cruz, Rand Paul. And we, again, we could read more and more and more that God has allowed us to get to these folks, to get the truth into their hands because a number of them are going to join with God's people here at the end. And I told Ted Cruz, I said, I understand your wife uh, is a former Seventh day Adventist. He said, Yeah. I said, Would you take one of these books? I gave him one before. I said, Would you take this one to your wife and ask her to read it one more time? Because time is running out. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. So we know that God's got people in high offices, He's calling them out. Again, I want to remind you of what it says in uh, Great Controversy. Great Controversy, page, uh, page 612. Great Controversy, page 612. Read that one more time. It says, The publications distributed by missionary workers have uh, exerted their influence, yet many whose minds were impressed have been prevented from fully comprehending the truth or from yielding obedience now the ray of, rays of light penetrate everywhere here at the end of the Sunday issue. The truth is seen in its clearness, and the honest children of God sever their bands from which they are held. Family connections, church relations are powerless to stay them now. Truth is more precious than all besides. Notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take their stand against the Lord take their stand upon the Lord's sides. We're also told, page 464, ministers and members uh, will follow the truth. We need to do our jobs, which is a pleasure, which is a joy, which is a blessing. It tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 1, 
God's word will not come back void. Cast the bread, the word of God on the waters, Revelation 17, 15, and after many days it shall return. Praise his name. I think of a story I uh, was told by uh, Dwight Remnant Publications. We work closely with another ASI uh, member. And uh, friends, if you're part of ASI, learn to network more because we can get a whole lot more accomplished. And uh, we want to work with you. We want to work with you to get the work done because as soon as the gospel goes, um, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then, then, then shall the end come. And only then. But he said in Australia, this man had one of the study Bibles, remnant study Bibles, and uh, he and his wife were gone someplace. Someone broke in their house, store, stole his briefcase, didn't take time to look through it, just grabbed it, and they'll look through it later. Anyway, uh, his Bible was inside of it, had his name and address inside and everything. Um, but evidently the thief just threw it off, threw it into the Pacific Ocean. And there was a Jehovah's Witness couple, and they were walking up the beach and just enjoying uh, the beautiful day, and uh, they saw something in the water uh, washing up with the waves, and it was that Bible. They took that Bible, and they took it home, and they dried it all out and everything, and they started looking through that Bible, and they looked and said, you know, all these little areas, these little blue areas in there, it's, it sounds like whoever that is sounds like they're almost, they could be a prophet. Well... She is a prophet, was a prophet. Anyway, uh, after a bit of time, they uh, took the Bible back to the man, had the name and address inside of it, was able to figure it out, got over there and gave it to the man, and they started Bible studies, and this Jehovah's Witness couple became Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Cast the bread upon the water. Even if a crook does it, it'll come home after many days. <laughs> Praise his name. And in Isaiah chapter 55, Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 11, in closing, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the day whereto I send it. God's word will not come back void. God has promised. He keeps his promise. And we can expect that work, our hearts will be changed. The work will be done in those hearts by the Spirit of God. And people are going to come into the truth, come into the truth, especially. And as it says in the Cole Porter ministry, They're going to come in in droves here at the end to take their positions that God has called them to take, to stand for the right though the heavens fall. He's going to have a people that are, have integrity that cannot be flattered, bribed, nor terrified. I want to be one of those. I want to, be, I want to let my shine, my light shine. Shine all over this world. Everywhere I go, I want to let my light shine. Let them know there's a Jesus. And this Jesus is coming soon. And he's going to get everything in order. As I tell some of the folks of color when I meet them and I share with them the books and various literature and things, I said, you know, we should have learned in Sunday school, Sabbath school years ago. Jesus loves the little children. Red and yellow, black and white. They're all precious in his sight. I said, that should take care of the race problem, don't you think? And they all agree. And um, there, many of them are very, very wide open. Very wide open. And we're meeting more and more people. Wherever we're traveling, we're meeting more and more people. And we offer the great controversy. They tell us, I already got that book. Where'd you get it? Well, I was at a meeting someplace and someone gave me one. Praise God. Friends, let's be faithful. Jesus is coming soon. You want joy? You want peace? You want happiness? Lead somebody to Jesus. 
and you'll get the biggest high you've ever had. Further, bigger high than any drug or any alcohol or any other thing can do to give you the high. And uh, knowing that you're going to spend eternity with these folks, praising God, traveling throughout his universe. So be faithful. If your ship comes in, don't forget us. So we can get this work, get more, more printed all the time. Paper keeps going up. Ink keeps going up. Let us do it while we can. And with the banks closing down and various people losing billions and billions and billions of dollars, now is the time to invest in God's work. Lay off treasures in heaven. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. I praise you for the privilege that we have. Lord, I pray that people understand who listen and watch this. Understand it's not about tooting horns. It's not trying to make a name for oneself. It is to uplift the King of kings and Lord of lords, to help others to see what God can do with mom and pop ministry, with people that don't have hardly any talents whatsoever, but what he can do, what God can do. Look at what God can do. Thank you in Jesus' glorious name. And may we look one day soon, look up and say, lo, this is our God, and he will save us and spend eternity with him. In Jesus' glorious and holy name we pray. Amen.